Hi, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 1 of our Medical Specialties and Pathophysiology course. So these are just vodcasts for the, the series of um, these videos, which means that I'm just going to run through the PowerPoints that I cover when I'm doing my classroom presentation and just voice over for the normal lecture that I would give. So I hope you find these helpful. If you don't, I will also post just my blank PowerPoints so that if it's easier for you, you can just flip through those or you can look at those while you're going through the vodcast or you can print them out and use them for notes. The joy of an online program is that you really have that flexibility. So let's get started with chapter one, an introduction to the structure and function of the human body. So first, let's just start off with some basic terminology review. Now, hopefully everyone has taken medical terminology, and so this really is just all review. But anatomy. Anatomy is the study of the structure of an organism and the relationship of its parts. Basically, what that means is just where is it and what is it called? Physiology, on the other hand, is the study of the function of a living organism and its parts. So that's more the what does it do. And that's why anatomy and physiology are normally studied together. Because it's hard to understand the importance of knowing the what it is and where is it if you don't know what it does. And it's really hard to study the what it does if you don't know the what and where it is. So they're normally studied together. Pathology, then, is the study of a disease. And so if we know what pathology is and we know what physiology is, we can sort of put those two words together. You know how medical terminology likes to shove different words together um, to know what pathophysiology means. And that's really the bulk of what this class is supposed to be. So pathophysiology is the study of the underlying physiological aspects of a disease. So I know that's kind of a mouthful. What that means basically is what is a disease doing to your body? So what is that disease doing to change your normal physiology? And that's really what I hope to teach you guys in this class. So let's do just some levels of organization. This will hopefully help you to understand some basics. So, um, the body as a whole is just constructed of smaller units, and you can break it down to smaller and smaller and smaller ones. So going from the smallest up, we just start with atoms and molecules. So this is the chemical level. I don't expect you guys to know any of that chemical level stuff. If you take a biochemistry class, you can learn it then. Um, but those atoms and molecules are bound together to make cells. And cells are the smallest structural units. And they're really just organizations of the various chemicals, the various atoms and molecules. So if those atoms and molecules get arranged in different ways, they're going to make different cells. And then cells that are similar can be arranged to make tissues. And then tissues that are similar are arranged to make organs. And then we group organs that serve a similar purpose together to make an organ system. So here's just a picture to help you hopefully understand that. So you can see here where there are atoms. Atoms are just normally represented by the little balls and the sticks. I know that that's really breaking it down to a incredibly simple level, and it's far more complicated than that, but that is normally how you would... Um, show what an atom looks like because they're too small to actually visualize. And then those are placed together to make molecules. And then molecules um, are arranged to make tissues. So here you can see we're actually doing a cardiac cell. So these are making the tissues that are being, um, or the cells that are then being arranged to make tissues. So you can see as it's building up, so there's more tissues and more complicated. Um, and then that actually makes the organ, the organ in this case being the heart, which then goes together to make this whole cardiovascular system because your heart's going to combine with um, similar organs in the same system to make, to make the whole functioning system. And this is how it works for all of your systems throughout your body. So 
now that we've covered that, we're just going to go back to really just still some very basic terminology. And this is just to help remind you of some stuff in case it's been a while since you took medical terminology. Um, or if you took it and maybe felt like you didn't grasp it, just a reminder covering some basics again. So anatomical position is the reference position in which the body is standing um, whenever we're, we're referring to medical things. So for anatomical position, you're standing erect, your feet are slightly apart, your arms are at your sides with your palms facing forward. And the importance of this position is really that it is used to give meaning to any of our directional terms. If we didn't have a set position that we assumed somebody was standing in, then our directional terms wouldn't have a meaning. Because if I'm lying prone, which means I'm lying face down, suddenly superior and inferior have totally different meanings than if I was lying on my back, right? So anatomical position is just to help give those terms a meaning. And that would be a picture of anatomical position. So since I mentioned superior and inferior, why don't we start there when we're talking about those directions. So superior means upper, above, towards the head. So it's above whatever the other part is. Inferior means below or towards the feet or lower. So it would be below. So I could say my pelvis is below my rib cage in like normal street terms, or I could say my pelvis is inferior to my rib cage, or my rib cage is superior to my pelvis. And then we'll do front and back. Anterior means to the front of something, and posterior means to the back. So what is in front of and what is behind? There's medial and lateral. So medial means towards the midline. So if I drew a line right down the center of my body, something medial would be closer to that line. Lateral means further away from that midline. So I could say my heart is medial to my, say my fingers. It'd be really dramatic there to give you an example. So my, my fingers are lateral because they're further away from that midline point. And then we have proximal. Proximal is towards or whatever is nearest to your trunk. And your trunk is just your, your chest and your abdominal area. So it's that center kind of thick portion that you have is, is your trunk. So proximal means closest to that. And distal means furthest away from your trunk. Um, so that would be like my, my toes are distal to my knee. And then for a couple terms, hopefully you're very familiar with even in normal everyday life, superficial means near to the body surface and deep means further away from the body surface. So superficial would mean like I have a superficial cut, like a paper, a little paper cut is superficial. Or if I had a puncture wound, that would be deeper because the, the furthest down point is further away from the body surface. So besides just those directions, we also divide the body into planes or, um, besides the directions, we divide the body into planes or different sections. So these would be the sagittal plane. The sagittal plane divides the body lengthwise, and that's into left and right sections. The mid-sagittal plane is the one that divides you right down the middle into equal left and right sections. So that's, that would be your midline point is that mid-sagittal plane. And then there's your frontal plane, which is um, also a lengthwise plane. So that means it kind of goes up and down from head to feet. And that divides you into anterior or posterior sections. So a front and a back. And then there's the transverse plane. So the transverse plane plane is a horizontal plane. So that's going to divide you into upper and lower sections. And here we can just see a graphic to help us visualize those directions and those planes. So we have superior, remember, up here towards the head. 
in inferior is towards the feet, anterior to the front, posterior to the back. Remember, distal is furthest away from um, the trunk. Proximal is closest to your trunk. You can see medial is towards the midline, this mid-sagittal plane, and lateral is away from that midline. And then we'll actually do our planes. So for your planes, you have your sagittal plane is this one right here. Remember that divides you into left and right sections. Your frontal plane divides you into front and back sections. And then your transverse plane divides you into a top and a bottom. So moving on from planes, let's cover some of the body cavities. So your body is made up of these open cavities that contain these very well-organized arrangements of your internal organs. So it's sort of like all these little puzzle pieces being fit into there, and then they're covered with membranes to hold them very neatly in place. So the two main cavities that you have are the ventral cavity and the dorsal cavity. So your ventral cavity um, is divided into a couple of other sections. We're going to start with the thoracic cavity. The thoracic cavity is your chest, and that's further divided into your mediastinum. Your mediastinum is the mid portion of your thoracic cavity, and that's where your heart and your trachea are located. So that's kind of right in the middle. It would be medial, using our, our previous terms. And then you have two pleural cavities. Your pleural cavities are your lung cavities. And there is a left lung cavity and a right lung cavity. So this is just to help you visualize a little bit of that. Um, so you can see that this is your thoracic cavity up here. You have your mediastinal one right there. And then your two pleural cavities. Since we're looking at the picture, we're going to touch briefly on the other ones, too. So after this thoracic cavity, um, as also part of your ventral cavity, is your um, abdominal pelvic cavity. So there's your abdominal portion of that, and there's the pelvic portion of that. And then you can also see here in this darker orange color that this is your dorsal cavity, so it contains your cranium and down your spinal cords. This is kind of your neuro cavity where your other organs are in your ventral cavity. So now to elaborate on your abdominal pelvic cavity. So this contains, like we said, the two separate sections, just like your thoracic cavity contained multiple sections. So there's your abdominal um, cavity, and that contains your stomach and some other GI organs like intestines, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, and your spleen. And then you have your pelvic cavity that contains reproductive organs and um, your urinary bladder and just the lowest part of your um, intestines. So to help further clarify your abdominal pelvic region, we've divided it up into even smaller regions. Now these ones aren't divided by a membrane, we just sort of draw imaginary lines. Um, and there are, so there are nine regions and four quadrants. And we do this just because if we look back here at the picture, it's a really big cavity. And the other thing that's really hard besides the fact that it's a really big cavity is that there aren't necessarily a ton of great physical landmarks here. So everybody knows that your heart's in the center of your chest and that you have a lung kind of on each side. That's very common knowledge. But once we hit your abdominal cavity, everything's really kind of squished together um, and things are on top of one another. And then there's your intestines, which just kind of go almost the whole length of it. And so we've divided it up into these quadrants and regions just to help give landmarks when you're trying to explain something. So we'll just cover the four quadrants first. And this is just right and left, upper, lower. Um, use these a lot, um, especially when identifying where pain is. Um, which you can kind of understand because let's say I say I have right lower abdominal pain. So that will be really important to know that it's not just abdominal pain, but that it's right lower abdominal pain because this right there is my appendix. 
So having right lower abdominal pain can mean something very different than, let's say, I have upper left pain. So it just helps us kind of narrow down what the cause might be. So then we can further break this down besides our four quadrants into the nine regions. And it's the same basic idea. This is just to give us a better idea um, of where something's happening. So a lot of the time doctors use this to say where they did something um, or people use it when doing notes to say like where a pain was located just to give people landmarks so that they have an idea of where, um, where something is or where they did a procedure or where there's pain located or where a drain is, anything like that. So that's why these are important. So now let's get away from the ventral cavity and we'll look at the dorsal cavity. So the dorsal cavity, like I said before, is basically your neuro cavity. So it's divided into two separate cavities, just like your ventral cavity was divided further down as well. And it's divided into your cranial cavity, which is what contains your brain, if you remember that was up by your head. And then there's your spinal cavity, which runs down the length of your spinal cord. So moving on from cavities, I know we're just kind of hitting all the little highlights here. Your body can also be broken down into regions. So there are two basic regions. These are most important when we're talking about your skeletal system. And that is that we have your axle region, which is your head, neck, and your trunk or your torso. Um, so kind of think about that like, you know, the axles are kind of that middle portion or what everything turns on. So axle is your head and your neck and your trunk. And then there's the appendicular region, and those are your extremities. So here you can see a picture of that. So the axle part is in more of this kind of light purpley color. So you can see our head and your spinal cord, your rib cage. So just head and your trunk. Where your appendicular skeleton is in this kind of beige bone color. And that is your extremities. And this does include what is used to attach those extremities. So as you can see here... Um, you have your shoulders and your pelvis, your collarbone there. So those are all, all parts of your appendicular skeleton as well. So all of that was pretty much just a review, basic going over terms, just so that we're kind of all caught up and refreshed and ready to move forward. So now what I'm going to cover is something that's vitally important, not only for our own survival, but pretty much why we're learning about all of this stuff in this class, and that's homeostasis. So homeostasis is the relative consistency of our internal environment. So homeostasis is basically keeping everything the same. And the reason why we're studying homeostasis is because our body's survival depends on our ability to maintain or to restore homeostasis. And so pathophysiology is really just learning about how diseases alter our homeostasis and what we do about it. So homeostasis is just so important for us to survive, and diseases just alter that. And that's why they make us sick, and that's why we see the symptoms that we do. It's just because they alter that homeostasis. They alter that consistent, normal, internal environment that we have. So our body does things to try to maintain that homeostasis or to restore it if it um, varies too far off track. So we use two different feedback loops. There's a negative feedback loop, and then very rarely we use a positive feedback loop. Um, and these feedback loops involve sensors. So there has to be something to pick up the signal that says you are no longer in homeostasis. There's a control center, which is almost always our brain. And that's just telling us, it's like taking in the information and telling our body then, okay, this is what we have to do to fix it. And then there's a, the effector. And that's where that control center sends the message to do whatever they have to do to fix or restore or maintain homeostasis. So for the two feedback loops, there's the negative one, like I said. And that's predominantly what our body uses. And what the negative feedback loop does is it basically does the opposite of whatever the problem is. 
So if we're cold, it's going to make us warm. If we're dehydrated, it's going to make us um, do what it can to rehydrate us. Where a positive feedback loop actually enhances whatever the thing that's not normal is. So um, the two major examples of this are with clotting and with um, childbirth. So we'll use childbirth because that's the more, more obvious one or the easier one to explain. And that's that your, your uterus starts to contract. Now, that contraction and that muscle usage is actually not, not normal. Like the continued muscle contraction, it's not what we would consider normal. Um, and so normally, you would want your body would trigger something to then correct whatever was making that muscle contraction happen so that it would stop. But in this case, because the ultimate end result is to give birth... And that when you give birth, the muscle contractions will stop. Your body, instead of stopping the contractions, actually just enhances them. So, and that's why contractions keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger until um, labor is complete and delivery happens. And then when you have clotting, normally clotting in your blood is a very bad thing because it can actually create blockages of vessels and kill tissue and it's very bad. So normally your body kind of does stuff to make sure that you don't clot. But if you're bleeding, so if you cut yourself and you're bleeding, um, then it's different because then your platelets start to form a little blockage over the cut and blood clots there and your body enhances that clotting to prevent you from bleeding out because it knows that that clotting is going to stop the bleeding. Now, not that you have little, that each cell has its own brain and knows what it's doing, but that's just sort of how we evolved. So those are, those are the two kind of areas in the body where it would actually be a positive feedback loop instead of a negative feedback loop. But we're going to look at negative feedback loops just a little bit more because those are the most most common ones. So we'll start with um with the cold example. So this class is out of Central Maine Community College. Obviously we're located in Maine. And as you can imagine it gets very very cold up here. So let's say it's winter time and I'm outside. And I'm outside for quite a while and eventually my body temperature drops. Well, I have cold receptors in my body that are going to pick up that temperature change and are going to send a message to my brain to say that my body temperature is no longer within the normal range. So now my temperature is out of homeostasis because it's not in that consistent environment. So my brain interprets that I'm cold and tells my body what to do about it. So in this case, it's going to say shiver. It's going to tell my muscles to start shivering. And shivering generates heat. And that's through a whole kind of complicated biochemical process that I won't get into. But um, anytime a muscle contracts, not only does it create movement, but it generates heat. So it's doing that to then warm me up so that my body temperature will once again be normal and within that homeostasis range that it wants to be in. Now, this is actually really similar to how the heating system in your house would be. So let's say still living in Maine, still winter time. And let's say that I opened up my window for some reason. I burned something when I was cooking and I was trying to get the smoke out. So that cold air that was outside is going to flood into my room and it's going to actually drop the temperature of my room. So I have a thermometer on my thermostat that's going to pick up that the temperature is, is too low. It's lower than what I have my room set at. So that set temperature for my room is basically my room's homeostasis level. So then that thermostat is going to say, oh, not right. We have to kick on the heat. So that thermostat's going to trigger my furnace to start working to make heat to then heat up my room. So that's just kind of an example of of how really these negative feedback loops are pretty common and our body is really working kind of a lot like other things in the world would. 
So um, pretty much, like we said, homeostasis is vital to survival. And all organs basically function just to maintain homeostasis. So their whole function is, is to keep us in that normal, constant level of everything so that we keep surviving. And our ability to maintain that balance, to maintain our homeostasis, um, peaks at a relatively young age, about when we hit young adulthood, which in reality to how long our lifespan is, is very young. And then it slowly decreases or diminishes and how efficient and effective it is over the rest of our life. And that is why an older adult, someone who's, you know, if you think about your grandparents or your parents, if you have aging parents, um, why they seem to go from being fine to being really sick all of a sudden. And that's because their body has lost its ability to maintain or regain homeostasis or lost how efficient or how well it can do it. So a little, um, like if we get a cold, maybe, and you're young and you're healthy, if you get a cold, it probably doesn't affect you that much. It's annoying. You feel a little crummy. Your nose is running. You're coughing a lot, but you can still basically keep going with your day. If you have an older adult who gets maybe the same cold, their body can't keep going like it normally would. They seem to get a lot sicker and it takes a lot out of them and they're more prone to getting complications because they can't maintain the same level of homeostasis that we can. So that's just an important fact to know and probably, hopefully at least, makes um some medical conditions or, or things that you've seen in your loved ones make a little bit more sense. So these are just some questions that I like to start off the semester with. This is the only PowerPoint that there are some questions located at the back. Um, and what I want you guys to do is just answer these questions as part of your um message board reply, as well as do with the normal message board um, posting that's required for the week. So I hope you learned a lot in this first lecture, and I look forward to spending the rest of the semester teaching you.